I got a little bit cocky then. I craned my neck right over to try and look at the, the stanchions down below to try and look at the, the legs of this aqueduct. And um, yeah, scared myself. Look at that, that is the Pont Cassata Aqueduct in Wales. It's 307 metres long and 38 metres high above the river water. It's the highest navigable aqueduct anywhere in the world. And today I want to look at it in more detail and hopefully see what it's like up there from a wobbly inflatable kayak on the water itself. So it's long, it's tall, and it's incredibly busy. This aqueduct is one of the busiest stretches of canal anywhere in Britain. And I'm not the best with heights. So today is gonna to be a personal challenge for me more than anything. I'm equally as excited and nervous about it. But anyway, before that, here's the history bit. By the start of the 1800s, Britain was slap bang in the middle of what is now known as canal mania a period of intense canal building happening throughout industrial parts of the country. Canals were the commercial highways of the day, and so new connections linking important towns and cities were always being sought. In 1791, one proposal called the Ellesmere Canal wanted to link the River Mersey with the River Severn. As you can see from the original plan, the idea was to have the canal link up the Mersey to the River Dee at Chester, and then head south through Wrexham, all the way down to the Severn at Shrewsbury. It also included a long branch arm going to Prees Heath via the town of Whitechurch. It was a shrewd plan that would link up the mining country of North Wales with the two major rivers bordering the country at either end. But as construction got underway, things began to change. The canal in its entirety was never actually built. But parts of it were. The first bit to be built was between Ellesmere Port what was then called Netherpool, and Chester. Money coming in from tolls here enabled the financing of the rest of the canal. Work also began on the Whitechurch branch and this branch here, eventually linking up to the Montgomery Canal. The problem was that Wales is, well, pretty hilly. In order to get the canal from Wrexham to Shrewsbury via this westerly course, the canal would encounter plenty of obstacles including this, the other end of the River Dee. The Dee rises way out west, deep in the mountains of Snowdonia. Travelling inland, it moves eastwards, passing through Llangollen, by which point it's become wide and fast moving, before eventually reaching Chester and becoming a minor waterway used by boats for thousands of years. Fun fact, there are also other River Dees in the British Isles, including one in Cumbria, one in Ireland, and two in Scotland. Crossing the Dee and its tributary, the River Ceriog, was therefore part of the canal's challenge. At Chirk, the valley was wider than the river below suggested, while a large hill immediately to the north meant a long, dark tunnel would have to be cut. But the depth of the valley here, at the village of Frankathachtha, was so great that the original plan, drawn up by engineer William Jessop, was for a series of locks taking the canal down to an embankment, and then back up the other side. But working just below Jessup on the canal project was a less experienced engineer called Thomas Telford, and he had a different approach. We'll look at that a bit later on. In the end, the middle section going through Wrexham was cancelled, as was the southern bit through to Shrewsbury. Instead, the length here was terminated at the village of Trevor, meaning that a feeder canal had to be dug from the Dee over at Llanticilio, several miles to the west, in order to supply water. Telford created a weir for this purpose, its distinctive shape giving it the name Horseshoe Falls. The valve house here makes sure that the water enters the canal at a nice constant rate. From here, the narrow canal squeezes itself inside this cutting next to the river, which gives it a unique look. 
The canal here is too narrow for boats to turn around, and so it's off limits. And you can see how shallow the canal is here anyway. However, a pony pulled passenger service still operates. Horseshoe Falls made sure that this entire canal, now called the Hlangothlan Branch Canal, remained open after much of the rest of the area's canals were closed in the 1940s. Okay, so now we come to the first of the big two valleys this canal had to cross to enter Wales. And it does so here at Chirk by way of this beautiful aqueduct right behind me. Now it's 220 meters long, 21 meters tall, and it has 10 arches altogether. And it crosses the river Kerryog just over there. So it was started in 1796 and completed in 1801. Now for both aqueducts we'll see today, Jessup and Telford went for an iron trough design, which is completely hidden on this one here, but not on the next one along. And of course the best thing about this aqueduct is that it has a railway viaduct running right alongside it, slightly higher up. That was built in 1848 and it's a very similar design. Together, both structures are so complementary when seen from the valley below. And what else is great about this viaduct is, by virtue of being on it, you've entered the World Heritage Site, which is everything from here all the way to Punkasutka Aqueduct, which we'll see later. But at the same time, what's even more special is by crossing this aqueduct, you've crossed the border from Wales into England or England into Wales. Wales is that way. So I've just been in and I've been out. Um, but yeah, that's such a unique thing. And by the way, Chirk Tunnel is 421 metres long and it's one of the first, apparently, to have a towpath running next to the canal inside the tunnel. The first canals built in Britain didn't have such a novelty. Okay, so I'm back in the kayak now, and it's pretty early in the morning, and I'm just leaving somewhere called Font Cassiste, and uh, yeah, and I'm heading off this early in the morning, because I want the aqueduct all to myself, um, before boats and people jam it all up. Right, so I'm just approaching the aqueduct now, and I can see right down it, I can see that it's absolutely clear. There's no boats on there. There's no people coming on the towpath even. Um, so I've got the green light to go ahead. Um, while I'm on there, it's worth noting that the towpath will be on the right hand side, as you can see here. And on the left hand side, there'll be nothing. It'll be a sheer drop down. It'd be like an infinity pool for canals. Um, and yeah, so I've got to make sure I don't lean too far to the left uh, or have a funny turn or something. Um, but yeah, I'm really, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it now. It's going to be exciting, this. Right, so I'm on the aqueduct now. I'm about a third of the way on. And you can see this is the side it's not quite an infinity pool but it's quite a substantial side to it to be honest but it does give away it looks like the side of a bathtub and that's what essentially i'm on is a, a huge long bathtub of water made of iron in fact the towpath there is above the water it's not the canal doesn't end here the, the tub of water the water goes underneath so the entire structure is the tub of water and i'm drifting backwards Right, so I'm essentially over the highest point of the aqueduct now. 
over the river down there far below and on the other side got this beautiful view down the valley including a viaduct over there um, but look behind me there's nobody there and ahead there's nobody there I've got this wonderful world heritage site all to myself um, yeah and it's fantastic do you have a look over the side Um, but yeah, it's high up. This is high up. It's only 30 odd meters But that's quite high up actually. It's quite high up Especially when you're essentially floating With nothing but this between you and the, the drop below But yeah, positives. This is great <laughs> Now interesting of course, or maybe not interesting to you is uh, the fact that when I stop doing what I'm doing I start drifting back this way. So the flow of water is away from the, the village of Trevor um, and towards the south um, which is the, the flow of the canal water obviously because um, Llangollen up there where you've got the Horseshoe Falls, the Horseshoe Falls feeding water into the canal is that way, is, is in the, the northerly westerly direction of the canal so everything opposite is flowing that way including me and I'm picking up quite some speed now <laughs> well it's the wrong way, I want to keep going that way Right, so there's a boat coming behind me, so I'm going to have to make a shift and get uh, off this aqueduct. Otherwise, I'm going to get squished. Um, so let's go and let's go check out Trevor Wharf. Right, so this where I am now is Trevor, a small village to the north of the aqueduct. And this was essentially going to be the end of the, the canal itself. In fact, it was supposed to go through the village itself, through Trevor, um, towards Rubon and Wrexham and Chester and join up and connect to the other canal network that way. But that bit was never built. And instead, you get the, the, the canal pushing through this in Trevor became Trevor Wharf. It became a very busy wharf with a railway coming down. Um, but yeah, today it's a very peaceful spot and a great place to park your canal boat. Right, so this is the end of the wharf now. And you have to remember there was a, a branch line, a railway branch line running north of the village of Trevor. So coming off that line, were several minor lines down to the wharf itself here, right here where I am now, allowing goods to move between train and boat. Podcast sucks the aqueduct was an engineering success. Telford's pioneering use of cast iron in large structures proved vital, and his iron trough design is on full exposure here. The long trough is wide enough and deep enough for just one boat, keeping its overall weight as low as possible. Its huge length means it consists of 19 arches, each spanning 14 metres for a total length of 307 metres. The whole thing stands 38 metres above the river at the highest point. Clambering below the aqueduct, you can see how many simple trough sections are connected together, and how large each piece of masonry involved in the support actually is. Telford himself went on to develop, design and consult a huge number of massive engineering projects in the 19th century including the Caledonian Canal, over 920 miles of roads in Scotland, the Gota Canal in Sweden, and many large projects along the London to Holyhead route, including beautiful suspension bridges at Conwy and Menai. 
And another fun fact, Thomas Telford also designed a bridge at Tongland in 1806 in Galloway, crossing one of the Scottish River Dees I mentioned before. So in the space of a calendar year, Telford had designed crossings over two different River Dees in two different countries. But the colossal aqueduct here remains one of his grandest achievements, the pinnacle of canal mania, the jewel in the crown of British canals. Right, here's one for the blooper reel. This is a real behind the scenes of what it's like to make a, a stupid YouTube video. So I went across, filmed myself, which is what you saw, and then I turned around and came back with a drone in the air. And um, that was fine. And then I realized I was filming myself going the wrong way, so the story wouldn't work. So I thought, I'll, I'll just film myself, just getting onto the aqueduct, the, the original way, with the drone in the air. And I, I went on a little bit and started filming. And then a canal boat came right on my backside, really quickly, and I thought, all right, I didn't want to get on the aqueduct again, so I, I thought I'd turn around. But the kayak is too wide for, the, for the, the aqueduct itself, so I couldn't turn around. So I basically had to power my way across a third time um, with a canal boat right on my backside. Um, so basically I was going as fast as I could across that aqueduct. And then, of course, I've had to come back a fourth time just to come back to where I am. <laughs> anyway, catch you in the next one.